So um, thanks for having me. I know I'm between all of you in lunch, so hopefully I will be um, somewhat entertaining. Um, so uh, what I want to thank you to um, David for inviting me, and I'm really enjoying this this conversation, and it's got um, it's got me thinking about a lot of different things. So what I want to talk about today. Um, so Joseph's just been talking about um, the ways that. Uh, the, the, the SAT in particular, and the way we do uh, the use of that in admissions, kind of reproduces inequality. And what I want to um, talk about now is how we do admission, how the way that we do admissions actually shapes students' own understandings of these processes of inequality, um, of um, merit, and also of race. Because I think in the United States, anytime we talk about admissions. Um, there is a sort of side conversation about um, affirmative action, um, and so I want to I want to talk about that. Um, and so I should say this this term meritocracy is kind of interesting because the, the term came out in the 1950s. Michael Young um, coined this term, but he coined it as a kind of dystopic vision for the future. And you know he he wrote this kind of satirical piece where he um, envisions uh, again a dystopia in which. Um, the notion of merit is used to reproduce class. So that is, it legitimates the class system so that um, it's seen as fair because it's merit-based. Um, and so what I want to ask is, um, how does this then um, affect the students who are then admitted under these supposedly meritocratic systems, right? So students get in, and we just saw a lot of data about, about um, this inequality, and then think that they are the the most deserving or um, that this is a fair system. And then what do they do with that? How does that affect um, their understandings of people who are not on campus, their empathy even, um, as, as um, Prudence talked about um, yesterday? So um, I'm going to talk about um, students and their conceptions of merit, race, and inequality. Um, and, um, and I'll just say that um, graduates of these universities, you know, liberal arts colleges, elite universities more broadly, the way that they think about these things matters a lot because these are going to be um, future decision makers in whether in you know whether it's policy, uh, government, um, the media, even uh, CEOs. These are uh, people are going to be enacting their understandings of fairness um, and deservingness um, in these positions of, of leadership in the future. Uh, and I, um, I'll just say the, the, the larger project compares students also across race lines and actually across um, national boundaries. But today I'm going to talk about um, students in the UN United States and in particular white students, US born white students um, in the United States. So, okay. Um, so I'm going to address three questions. How do white undergraduates at elite universities make meaning of merit in admissions, especially with respect to underrepresented groups? Um, and how do their universities shape that uh, meaning making? So I think about this both in terms of the admissions process, um, but also when they get to campus, the kinds of conversations that they're having among their peers. Um, also, uh, in the United States, we have a lot of uh, diversity-related um, infrastructure. And I say diversity and not race, because it's really framed in this language of diversity that I'll talk about. Um, both, you know, not just affirmative action, minority student centers, um, uh, student groups, etc. Um, and third, what are the implications of that meaning making, especially when coupled with diversity related university policies and practices? Okay, I'm going to put my watch here. So. Okay. so I won't say a lot about admissions. I think um, probably it sounds like most of people here will know um, how this works. Um, in addition to the SAT and GPA, there's uh, teachers and es recommendations and essays. And um, the Harvard Dean of Admissions talks about, um, quote, an expansive view of excellence, um, extracurricular distinction and personal qualities, and diversity. And if you go um, on the website of most selective, uh, whether it's liberal arts colleges, um, universities, you'll see very similar language. Um, uh, and I think that's not, probably not a coincidence. I think they're watching each other very closely. If you look at some of the data, um, you know, this. That 40% was pretty, um, you know, I think that's another, you know, in terms of students on financial aid, minority students, you see a very similar outcomes as well. Um, so what might we expect from students? How might undergraduates make meaning of the meritocracy that, um, that uh, in their universities? So how will students respond? On the one hand, we might expect students to critique. 
uh, their universities. There's kind of a long history of social protest in higher education. Um, in campuses around the world, uh, students protest everything, things that are going on campus in the larger world. Um, you know, some scholars talk about student protest as kind of its own culture with its own sets of rituals. Um, and there's a kind of um, what Doug McAdam calls the kind of biographical availability of college, of residential college students. They, um, they have excess time. They're at a kind of developmentally at an age where um, of exploration they've uh, shifted their social ties. So there's a new kind of network developed. Um, and there's a lack of family commitments, um, again, for students on these residential campuses compared to um, at different other stages of life. And so, if, you know, and, and here I'm not even thinking about, so, you know, joining a protest. I'm just talking about critiquing what their universities are doing or, or at least, in, you know, expressing a critique if not doing anything, even if they're not doing anything about that critique. So on the one hand, we might expect a liberal critique. We know that students on college campuses are, tend to be liberal, more liberal than the larger population. College graduates tend to be more liberal than non-college graduates. Um, and so students, um, given these identities, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the study that I did, but in this study, I, one of the things I asked students was their political identity. They tend to identify as liberal as well. Um, they might feel compelled to grant a kind of liberal critique of their universities and express that critique as a sort of part of the way that they think about, if I think of myself as liberal, when someone asks me a question, I answer um, with a kind of liberal response. Um, which would say that there needs to be more class and race diversity. Um, as we know, selective universities tend um, to have uh, underrepresentation of both um, African American Latin and Latino students as well as um, working class and poor students. And so we might expect students to say this. And sorry, I'm, I'm going to. Um, so th there was this movement at Harvard, um, the I2M Harvard campaign, where students were very explicitly critiquing. This was not admissions, but their um, feelings of exclusion from the university. Um, so on the other hand, we might expect a con conservative critique. Um, and um, you know, certainly we hear there's always a, a strong, a, a small but vocal minority of students critiquing affirmative action. Um, so we might expect students to express this critique. Um, and on the other hand, we might expect a process of kind of what I call status legitimation. And that is that students might reproduce the admissions policies that got them to where they are in the first place. So I got in, I worked really hard, it must be fair, right? And if I say that it's not fair, then that kind of undermines my own sta status that I feel as, as a winner in this system. And this is a kind of self-interest story. So, and this, this will lead students to say that this is a fair system. Okay, so I'm not going to say too much about this. Um, just to say, I'll tell you that I interviewed students at Harvard um, and at Brown, and um, I won't go into the details about the differences between those two places and why I chose those, but um, very similar numbers, uh, percentages of uh, minority students. Um, and obviously this varies a little bit from year to year, but not a lot, because the the, again, the universities are looking very closely at these numbers. Um, and, um, they were, uh, I'm going to rely on the interviews today um, with 47 white students. 15% um, 15, 15 of them are also first generation college students. And I'll, uh, conversation with the Dean of Admissions, and I visited some diversity related events um, at orientation. And I'm going to focus on uh, a few questions that we asked in the, in the interviews. First, would you say your, your, your university is a meritocracy in terms of admissions? In what ways and what ways is it not? Um, then we give them the uh, data on the underrepresentation of black and Latino students on campus and ask them uh, to how they would explain that underrepresentation, um, whether this is a, ask them whether it's a problem, and if so, what the university should do about it. Um, and we also ask them whether the university should consider race or ethnicity um, in admissions. And a more general question about how diversity has affected uh, campus life at all. So those are some of the questions that we asked, and I'm going to focus on those today. Okay, so what merit means at Harvard and Brown among the students? First, um, the first thing I notice is that there is this real kind of notion of the kind of collective merit of the cohort. So under this model that students espouse, everyone kind of has a hook. And together, this, this cohort makes a diverse group that leads to better learning um, and an overall uh, richer college experience. So this, this is the kind of diversity talk and diversity broadly speaking. So here's a student at Brown that said, 
I think before I applied, I thought I didn't like the fact that it's really easy for recruited athletes. I've had issues with that. But now that I'm here, I don't have those issues because I see, like, I love going to the football games. It's fun. It's part of the student life. I used to think that having athletes who are quote unquote less qualified, but I no longer see them as less qualified. I view them as qualified in a different way. So I think this quote also um, highlights the influence of the college experience on students' conceptions of fairness. Um, and we know, again, athletic recruiting um, is, is, is another mechanism by which inequality gets perpetuated because you may have some students who are coming in from uh, disadvantaged schools um, to play uh, more traditional sports, say football or basketball, baseball, but the vast majority of student athletes are coming in playing sports like um, lacrosse, crew, um, et cetera, coming from privileged backgrounds. So here's another student talking about um, uh, music, musical talent. He says, everyone I've met here has at least one thing that makes them who they are, and very rarely is it actually that they are a science fair winner. Or the example that I talk about is my friend um, who's Korean American. He's the biggest slacker maybe I've ever met in my life, the Harvard student, mind you. Um, but he's gifted as a composer and as a pianist. To me, that's just one of the many people that have one unique thing that makes them who they are, on top of good grades, good SAT scores, whatever. So this musical talent um, is, is another form. And, here's a st and, and one of the things that surprised me also was that students were even um, uh, OK with legacy admissions. About half of the students, when asked about legacy admissions, said, you know, and a, a yes, even if it was an ambivalent yes. And that, that really kind of stunned me a little bit. And so this student, so, um, it, this student says, um, when asked about legacy admissions, given that people who went to Harvard are much more likely to donate to the university and contribute and continue donating if their children go to Harvard, I think that's a reason to advantage them in admissions. Um, and so, you know, remember that Harvard has, a, Harvard in particular, I think, has a $30 billion endowment, but um, clearly, you know, needs, needs to use. Um, it, money seems like a fair contribution to that collective merit. You bring your athletic skills, you bring your musical talent, you bring your money. Um, and of course, you bring your race. And race gets folded into this as well as just another dimension of this diversity. Um, so when students perceive all admits to have this hook in this incredibly competitive process, being black or Latino or Native American becomes another form of diversity. So here's a student who compares being a racial minority to be a, a talented pianist. It's like a um, Ethnic diversity adds as much to the class as somebody who is a world-class piano player. And it's just a sort of different diversity to add. So it's this kind of commodification of um, uh, skin color um, through this kind of collective merit understanding. Um, in addition, students talk about um, needing to calibrate evaluations of merit. So looking at the opportunities that someone has had, um, and um, whether that person has made the most of opportunities available to them. Um, and this, this is actually a comparative study with the UK. I'm not going to talk about the UK today, but that's a, ver that's a very different understanding than in Britain. So um, here's a student who says, what needs to be considered in your admissions is how you've made the most of the opportunities you've had. And, the, and in that sense, if you go to like a private school that's maybe like really rich and a really great education, and then you have somebody who went to a public school that maybe didn't have as much money, but they took huge full advantage of the opportunities that they had there, and like they really milked it for all it was worth. This is like, you know, gets very, um, then the person from the private school wasn't like that, then the person from the public school should get it. So this idea that, um, you know, making the most of opportunities. And here's another student who said, if you, have a very, if you had a very hard life, but you did, let's say you got A's and B's instead of straight A's, but you had to work like 20 extra hours a week than another kid, um, then I think that speaks a lot more than if you got straight A's. Because if you have to provide for your family or help provide, sorry, you had to provide for your family or to help provide for them. So I think it should be taken into account. So um, the interesting thing is the students sort of frame these sort of extreme cases. But that, you know, this idea that um, the whole picture needs to be taken into account. Um, and um, the, this calibration um, most frequently was about class. And when asked about race um, in this cal in, in, to um, rectify racial inequality, students would say, well, you know, this is really about racial inequality, uh, sorry, class inequality, not race. And so um, these views were based in part by, on what I call students' race frames. So I'm going to take a minute to talk about um, their understandings of the role of race in society, because I think that sort of undergirds their understandings of merit. 
Um, so first, um, uh, students uh, kind of come uh, talk about the, um, use a kind of colorblindness frame to talk about issues of race. So both in terms of how they see the role of race in society and their sort of normative um, desire for how, um, how we want our society to be. So here's a student who says, no one looks at you like I look at you and I don't see, this is, she's speaking to a white interviewer and she says, I don't look at you and say, oh, this is a white person. That's definitely not the first thing I see. And I don't think a large amount of the people here see it at all. Um, again, this is a kind of both um, an empirical claim, but also a normative desire. And you know, we know the research in social psychology tells us that we see race all the time, right? And that this is just not true, but this is the student's perception and there's a kind of desire to be like that. Um, and so, you know, in terms of racial inequality, a student says, I don't really think there's too much of racial problems left in this day and age. Um, and so that means that um, color, this um, calibrated evaluation really gets couched as a class issue rather than a race issue. And race gets folded into this collective merit. Um, and so that leads me to um, this diversity frame. Um, so students talked about race as a kind of positive cultural identity that shapes individuals' worldviews and cultural practices, and that this was what was going to contribute to that collective merit, um, and that was a reason to um, consider it in admissions. And so here's a student who says, diversity is at the essence of Harvard life. Every day here is just about millions of activities by different groups. I think Harvard is the place where cultures are always coming together and people are doing things with their own culture, but also exposing everyone else at Harvard to it. And that exposure is part of what, you know, the, the kind of moral claim of the collective merit, right? That, that exposure is what this is about. Um, and this, again, comes from their college experiences. So here's a student who says, coming here, I really have a lot of res more respect for multiculturalism. I mean, as far as diversity goes, like when people said Brown has a lot of diversity, I didn't really care about that. I thought it was just a college. Um, he's talking about when he was applying. And then he says, and since I've been here, I think it's really important. I think that actually experiencing other cultures as opposed to experiencing whatever passes for multiculturalism in like your all white little preschool or whatever it is has really been influential on me. So comes to campus and changes his understanding and develops this kind of diversity frame that this is something that is really gonna benefit me in particular ways. Um, here's a, um, a young woman I call Serena, um, who was an athletic recruit. Um, she says, um, when asked about whether the university should consider race and ethnicity in admissions, she says, yes, I think they should, because I think the different viewpoints that students bring from um, different backgrounds is very valuable to the larger purpose of education. So it goes um, down, it goes to the whole kind of reason um, of, of these universities and what they're setting out to do. Okay. So the kind of justification for affirmative action becomes this collective merit and the, this, uh, which undergirded by this diversity frame, rather than any kind of um, uh, recognition of racial inequality or racial injustice or, or past, um, past inequality. So this leads students to what I call the diversity bargain. Um, and um, what I mean by that is that they'll support affirmative, affirmative race-based affirmative action in as much as it um, benefits themselves. So, and it does this by first contributing to their own educational experiences, in part um, by um, black and Latino students who are all thought to be admitted through affirmative action by them integrating with white students. Um, so here's a student who um, uh, was asked about whether she sees evidence of multiculturalism on campus. Um, she went to a predominantly white high school. And she says that, yeah, I think to Harvard's a pretty diverse place, but I think the diversity ends up being a lot of different groups that sort of self-select and associate with their particular culture. I don't know that there's much interaction between the different groups. And then the interviewer asked her, well, what do you, what do you think of that? Um, and she says, it really bothers me because it makes it, makes it really difficult to know, get to know people because I'm not in any of these. Like, I'm not gonna join the Black Students Association and most of the groups that I'm in aren't, are not race, and she means race, aren't race-based. Because if they had a white students association, they'd probably get in a lot of trouble. I think it's just sort of sad because the interaction that I have had with people from different backgrounds has been so great for me, and especially coming from a school where there wasn't a lot of that. Um, so we see this sort of, you know, this sense of um, 
uh, I'm, I'm missing out because students are joining the Black Students Association. And the kind of equ equating of a Black Students Association with a White Students Association, right? I mean, she gets that, okay, that's not okay, but not, but not enough to sort of, but she still draws this parallel because these are equivalent groups, right? The, and the, the, there's a lack of a recognition of inequality and why black students as a, as a minority group might um, have other reasons that they, they want, they need a, um, a separate space. Um, and it contravenes this kind of diversity bargain. Um, it doesn't allow her access as she sort of sees it. Um, the other thing that it does is it means that students have to have a particular kind of experience that gets defined as the black experience or the Latino experience in order to um, um, benefit from affirmative action. So here's a student asked about um, considerations of race and ethnicity and she says, I don't think because someone checked, out, out the, checked the black box or like the Latino box that that should be what helps get them in. You know, Maybe in their interview you find out that like since they're Latino, they've done all these things that maybe add something different to the cultural fabric of Harvard. I know people who are like a quarter Mexican who got the Latino Scholars Award and their entire experience has been a white experience. So it's a kind of essentialized understanding of what it means to have a quote unquote white experience, a Latino experience, um, and that this again contravenes that diversity bargain because if you're supposed to, bringing something, bring, supposed to be bringing something to that collective merit, and you've had the experience that the majority of students have had on campus um, racially, then you shouldn't benefit from affirmative action. But it reproduces these kind of essentialized understandings of, of um, racial experiences. Um, and the third thing about this diversity bargain is that, stu that students need to feel that it, doesn't, it, that it doesn't deprive themselves of opportunities. Um, so, you know, they've just, um, won this incredibly competitive contest to two of the most elite um, selective universities in, in the country. And, um, but in the future, there are gonna be plenty of competitive um, uh, competitions that they're, they're not going, even the best of them are not going to get everything they desire um, in life. That's part of life. Um, so here's an, um, a student uh, in response to the question, um, have there ever been instances in which you felt you've experienced racial discrimination? And the student says, if I hadn't gotten into Harvard, I would have felt I'd been discriminated against. If someone else I knew who, who was equally qualified and who was a minority, if they had gotten in over me. And it's, you know, I had to think about that, we were talking about grammar training the other day. I had to think about this, this verb tense, the kind of conditional past perfect tense. But this idea that if, you know, I got into Harvard, but if I hadn't gotten in, then I would have felt this, right? So that reverse discrimination script that is in her head. It's ready to deploy. Um, and you know, there's going to be another instance in which she doesn't you know, get that internship or get that job or get into that class. And she's going to wonder, is it because um, of any kind of affirmative action? Right. And there's, you know, other people have written about this, the fact that you know, one uh, minority um, benefits from affirmative action and 10 or 20 um, non-minority uh, individuals think that, they, that, that that's why they didn't get what they wanted. So this diversity bargain is really embedded in students' definitions of merit. Um, so and, um, but overall, uh, the students aren't really critiquing what the universities are doing, right? They are, um, a lot of the language that they're using really mirrors what their admissions officers are saying. Um, and um, you know, if you look at the language, the, the language is uncannily similar. It's almost like the students have really kind of spent a lot of time poring over what it takes to get in and then reproducing that, sy that system that they've become a part of through their training in high school um, and then being on these campuses. Um, so what I'm really seeing is this process of status legitimation. Um, students really reproduce um, what they're hearing, this collective calibrated merit. And so, um, then I ask the question, well, why not critique? Um, why, um, why aren't they a little more critical? And, you know, it might be that perhaps when um, uh, we might see meaning making around self-interest uh, much more when, um, okay, you know, what I call symbolic politics, uh, symbolic politics approach that is that um, they, uh, um, uh, express critiques in line with their kind of identities as liberal, when first their status is at stake, um, you know, they're much, perhaps when, when one's own status is at, at stake, um, one's much less likely to express critique, or there's a kind of 
significant investment in the system of rewards. So, um, you know, students might assume that their definition is the best, most fair one, and that it brings the most deserving people on campus because they have worked so hard to get to these places. And um, they, um, whether it's through athletics, musical talent, grades, um, they, their subjective feeling is that they've worked hard. What they don't realize is that plenty of other um, uh, 18 year olds have worked just as hard if not harder or who haven't even had the opportunity to work hard towards this goal um, and they don't see that the, uh, rather the unspoken implication is that those who aren't here aren't as deserving of this of this incredible reward and this incredible opportunity um, and so you know given that this is so competitive it might be that um, you have to really embody this um, and take on this cultural narrative in order to have any chance shot of getting into these places. Um, and you know, once they're on campus, they're told from day one, they're the best of the best, the strongest cohort ever, the lowest admin rate ever. I'm always perplexed by every year the, co the campus newspapers have this, this, the front page article, lowest admin rate ever, and I always, you know, 5%, four, I don't think they've gotten down to 4% yet, but I'm sure they will. But I'm always puzzled by that, like why is that a good thing? To me that's crazy, right? Um, and how can we think that this is a, to me it also calls into question, like really, how can this be a fair system? But to them it sort of really feeds into this idea that this is incredibly competitive, so it's, you know, you are even better, right, than the cohorts before you. So um, uh, what are the implications of um, uh, students' meaning making um, in terms of their perspectives on merit and al also the diversity practices on campus? I haven't talked a lot about that, but you know, if we think about race-based affirmative action and a, what I call a diversity culture um, that um, distinguishes kind of uh, selective higher education from, say, K-12 education in the US. Um, first, I'm going to talk about um, their students' views on non-traditional students. Um, there is what I call the integration imperative, and I talked about this earlier in terms of the diversity bargain. That, um, recall that student who says that, you know, the students joining the Black Students Association, uh, I don't have access to them. And through this diversity frame, um, I argue that an interaction with peers of color becomes a resource that white students feel entitled to or sometimes wrongly deprived of. Um, because they're not, if they're not holding, they're upholding their end of the, this diversity bargain. Um, second, um, I see kind of these peer evaluations, right? When everyone seems to have a hook under this collective merit, you're always trying to figure out, well, how did you get in? How did that person get in? How did that person get in? What is their thing? Um, and so, you know, this student says, here at Harvard, I've never met anyone who didn't deserve to be here. I think everyone here is extremely capable. Now, that's a positive assessment, but I argue that, um, m and sometimes these were negative assessments, mostly they were positive, but they're still assessing each other. And this looks very different in the British case, um, for example. Um, and in terms of the, the mechanism to increase access, uh, we know, again, that there is um, uh, underrepresentation. And this is via the diversity bargain that I spoke of earlier. Um, and I think because it, the emphasis is on diversity, um, there's this sense that um, there's already a quorum, there's enough diversity to sort of meet that need of collective merit, rather than, so they're not looking at underrepresentation, they're looking at is there a quorum for me to benefit. So, the, so there is this belief that the university promotes equality, that yeah, we're, we've done our job, the university is doing a good job with this, even if there is an um, underrepresentation. So this student says, um, I know there's a lot of emphasis on maintaining a diverse student body, um, so I don't know that there's anything lacking in that area. I think they're very aware of making sure that Brown has a representative population. Maybe not exactly rep reflecting the US population, but making sure there's a wide range of students on campus. So it's about the wide range of students on campus, not about um, representation. Um, so there's a belief that it's a fair system um, and that yeah, affirmative action um, promotes equality and we're kind of, our job is done. Um, and in terms of their views on race, um, race and diversity, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time to talk about this, but there is this kind of dynamic on campus that where uh, I think some of the you know, students come to this incredibly diverse place for the first time in their lives. They have this diverse, this idea that we need to sort of take advantage of this. I need to expand my mind. 
Um, but they don't know how to do it, and they don't gain the tools to figure out how to do this work. Um, and there is this fear of being called out as racist. Um, among, again, this is among the white students. So the student says, I was hanging out with someone and just like, I don't know, I said something, and he took it as, I don't know, like white privilege or what have you, and it was just the entire night was awkward as anything just from that point on, because the entire night in my mind I was going over, did I, was that, because we had been drinking. And so I was thinking, was that like a messed up thinking to say? Maybe it was, like trying to think about how I said was messed up. I'm still going over it in my mind. So there is this sort of inability to sort of um, have these conversations um, uh, across racial lines. Students of color also expressed um, uh, frustration with, with uh, comments that Peard made and also talked about um, kind of deeply um, uh, influential negative experiences with racism that they had um, earlier in life and that certainly shapes their, um, their interactions um, on campus as well. Um, on the one hand. On the other hand, there is, I think, as a perhaps on the flip side of this, there is this kind of racial resentment below the surface. So that, you know, that, that reverse discrimination narrative that I talked about earlier is sort of bubbling under the surface. Um, and I think because this diversity frame is quite weak and it doesn't address inequality and power differences between <coughs> race groups, um, it, it sort of leads to this racial resent resentment. Um, and so here's a student who came from a self-described privileged family. He says that I've gotten to see affirmative action from like the point of view of the person who is being, I don't want to say used against, but kind of like who's not being favored by it. Um, it makes you a little bitter seeing dozens of white or Asian people applying for a job and then your African American friend gets it through a minority program that's like half as competitive. So again, this is, there is this perception that, um, that, there, that there is a, a, a zero sum perception about, um, about these competitive processes. Um, um, but later, the same student, when asked about um, race-based considerations and admissions, does say that, yeah, I think that there should be. There needs to be, he calls it a minimum diversity threshold. Um, and so, again, it's about um, the benefit to himself, which, you know, when it crosses that line and um, he's not getting an internship, then that's, then it's affirmative action gone too far. So, okay, so I talked about this legitimation of status um, that students um, are expressing. Um, and what I really see is students um, kind of entering, entering into this colorblind global individualist elite. And so when I look at the UK case, um, in Britain, admissions is done in a very different way, um, much more kind of absolute test scores, but there's also an interview. But they also reproduce what their, their universities are doing. But um, they also espouse colorblind views. Um, and it's, you know, I talk about this collective merit of the cohort, so it's this, it's this um, seemingly collective, but really it's about the individual, right? Individual benefits. Um, and, you know, with this idea that fair, with, a, with a definition of fairness that rests on meritocracy. And I would argue, and, and Joe Suarez has talked about this, th use this phrase, the ultra, ultra meritocracy. As these places are getting in, um, increasingly competitive, this increasing competition even more legitimates these systems as fair and meritocratic. Um, and selecting the best students, when in fact, the more selective they become, we know that the increasing, um, uh, the decreasing diversity in terms of students from disadvantaged backgrounds um, uh, gaining within those systems. Um, and, so, um, and so in general, I see this work as kind of illuminating how these systems of reward are not just, so one thing is, is this a fair system, um, which um, the previous um, speaker talked about, but also, these systems of reward shape and, ref in addition to reflect um, meaning making in other domains. Um, and you know, in this case, I've been talking about um, the role of race on campus. So what is the path forward? Um, and I sort of was thinking about this last night um, in my hotel room. And so this is very sort of um, uh, fresh and perhaps not as well thought out. So first, I think, um, you know, I think it's important to reduce kind of what, what um, Fishkin calls these bottlenecks, right? The, the idea that these degrees um, matter so much because they get used, that, that Harvard degree, the Sarah Lawrence degree, gets used as a gatekeeper to certain institutions. There's this great book um, by Karen Ho called Liquidated where she talks about these, these elite financial firms and they literally take their kind of 
key players, they, they get jobs through, um, from graduates at these elite, elite universities, and like um, here we're talking Harvard, Princeton, Yale. And then the kind of back office workers, college graduates, they take from state schools. And there's no, there's kind of this sense that you've got, you've got this badge, right? And they're not looking at your grades. We know that they're not looking, they're just looking at that degree. And I think that's problematic, right? Be and this system of merit fuels that, because this, I, if, if you think that it's so hard to get into these places, then that is a marker, and then people use that beyond, you know, um, what you actually did in college, or what, you know, who you are as a person. So I think that is a, a problematic to begin with, is what we do with these degrees. Um, second, I think that it's important, that we need to start framing affirmative action not as through this diversity rationale, but as redress. And I know that this, the legal context is complicated, but I think, in the, I don't think that we should be kind of beholden to that legal context. The public debate is not just about this diversity rationale. And I think we really need to sort of come back to the, and this is not where the roots of affirmative action lie, and I think we need to come back to that um, Universities need to take a stronger stance on this. Third, um, I think it's, um, universities need to promote um, what Gurren um, calls intergroup dialogue and just being able to facilitate these cross-racial conversations um, and discussions for students really to um, engage with each other. Um, and lastly, um, and admissions, I think, um, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I don't have a, again, this is not a well thought out um, plan, but I've been thinking about this for, for many months, an admissions lottery. And I think that the, the reason that I think a lottery is, and you know, the, the logistics, you could have a certain bar above which all students are qualified. You could have certain um, uh, measure, uh, um, what's it called? of the word. You could have certain criteria by which um, you include certain, you know, whether it's athletes, di uh, racial diversity, whatever it is, legacies. But this idea, but a lottery, um, in addition to reducing the way that privilege gets rewarded, um, it also would change the meaning of admission, what merit means, in ways that might encourage students to really see more clearly these arbitrary arbitrary privileges that they've had both in gaining admission but also in, sorry, in, in, in becoming qualified to even apply but then even into gaining admission in which, um, that, and these privileges that they and their peers in college have enjoyed. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the 